Treasure Island, Episode 1, The Old Sailor, Part 1 I remember him as if it were yesterday. He came slowly to the door of the Admiral Binbow Inn, his sea chest following behind him on a handcart. He was a strong, heavy man with long hair and an old blue coat. His hands were rough and black with dirt, and he had a long scar from a sword across one cheek. He knocked at the inn door, and when my father opened the door, called roughly for a glass of rum. This is a pleasant, quiet bay for an inn, he said, and looked slowly around him at the cliffs and our inn. Here, mate, he cried to the man with the handcart. Help me get my chest inside, he continued. Rum and simple food is what I want. And that cliff up there where I can watch the ships. You can call me the captain. Oh, I see what you want, he said with a fierce look and threw down three or four gold coins in front of him. All day, he was around the bay or up on the cliffs with his telescope. All evening, he sat in the inn by the fire drinking rum. Mostly, he did not speak when spoken to, but looked up suddenly and angrily, and we learned to stay away from him. He was very nervous of other sailors who come to the inn. One day, he quietly promised to give me a silver four penny coin every month if I would keep an eye open for a seaman with one leg. The captain often drank too much rum and sang his old wild sea songs. Then he used to hit his hand down hard on the table for silence before telling his frightening stories of the sea. They were about hangings, storms at the sea, and terrible crimes. During the months that the old sailor stayed with us, my father became very ill. One day, Dr. Livesley came to see him, and before he left, the smart, bright doctor sat in the same room as our dirty old sailor, who suddenly started his usual song. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest, yo ho ho and the battle of rum, drink and the devil had done for the rest, yo ho ho and the battle of rum. Later on, he banged his hand on the table, which we all knew was a call for silence. Everyone, apart from Dr. Livesley, stopped talking. A few moments later, the captain cried, Silence! If you were talking to me, sir, said Dr. Livesley, I have one thing to say. If you go on drinking so much rum, then the world soon be free of a very old dirty scoundrel. The captain jumped to his feet and took a knife out of his pocket. The doctor did not move, but spoke slowly. I am a man of the law, a magistrate, as well as a doctor. If you don't put the knife away, you will go to the next court and will be hanged. A few uncomfortable moments passed until the captain finally put the knife in his pocket and sat down heavily. Treasure Island, Episode 1, Part 2, Black Dog It was early one January morning, while the captain was out at the beach with his telescope, that the inn door opened, and a man stepped in who I had never seen before. He wore a sword in his belt, his skin was an unpleasant color, and two fingers were missing from his left hand. He sat down at a the table, then called me closer. Is this here table for my mate, Bill? he asked, a strange look on his face. I said, the table was for a man who we called the captain. Well, he said, my mate would be called the captain probably. 
He has a cut on one cheek and he's very pleasant when he's drunk. Is my mate Bill? So, is he here? I told him he was out walking. Well, I replied, you and me will just get behind the door and give Bill a little surprise. He made me hide and I became very worried when I saw him take out his sword. At last, the captain came in and walked toward his breakfast table. Bill, said the stranger. The captain turned to face us. His face turned white. Come, Bill, you know me, your old shipmate, surely, said the man. The captain's eyes opened wide and he said, Black dog? That's right, black dog. Come to see his old shipmate, Billy. Ah, we have seen some times together. Since I lost these two fingers, he said, holding up his hand. I brought them some rum, then left the room. At first, I could only hear low voices, but then they became louder. Then, all of a sudden, there was a loud swearing, and I heard something crash to the floor. There was the sound of metal against metal, and then a cry of pain. The next moment, I saw Black Dog running away with the captain close behind. They were both carrying swords, and Black Dog had blood streaming from his shoulder. But Black Dog was faster than the captain, and he was soon outside and over the hill. The captain came back into the inn and said, Jim, rum. But he, as he spoke, he started to fall against the wall. Rum, he repeated. I have to get away from here. I ran to get the rum. While I was in the next room, I heard a crash. I ran in and found him lying on the floor. The captain was breathing very loud and hard. His eyes were closed and his face was horrible color. My mother had now came downstairs, but we did not know what to do. At that moment, Dr. Livesey came in on his way to see my father. He's made himself very ill with too much rum, but I'll do my best to save his life, said the doctor when he had looked at him. The doctor pulled off the captain's shirt to start his walk, and I saw several tattoos on the captain's arm. They read, Hair's luck, a fair wind, and Billy Bones. It was some time later before the captain opened his eyes. First, he looked around the room, and then he tried to get up, crying, Where's Black Dog? There's no Black Dog here, replied the doctor. You've been drinking rum, and you've had a stroke. Now, what I have to say to you is this. One glass of rum won't kill you, but if you take one, you will take another, and if you don't stop, you will die. Come on now, I'll help you to your bed. We managed to get him upstairs and onto his bed. He should lie in bed for a week, said the doctor. As soon as we had closed the door, that's the best thing for him and you, but another stroke will finish him off. Treasure Island, Episode 1 Part 3 The Black Spot At about midday, I went to see the captain. He seemed both weak and excited. Jim, he said, Every month I've given you a silver for a penny. You will bring me a little drink of rum now, won't you? The doctor, I began. He started to swear and then said, what does a doctor know about life at sea? I've lived on rum, I tell you. Your doctor said himself, one glass wouldn't hurt me. I'll give you a golden genie for some, Jim. I want what you owe my father, that's all, I said. For he had been very slow to pay us. I'll get you one glass and no more. When I brought it to him, he took it quickly and drank it down. Eh, he said. That's better. How long do I have to lie here? A week, at least, I said. I can't do that, he cried. But he was too weak to get up, and he lay back for a while in silence. Jim, he said, after a time. It's my old sea chest they want. If I can't get away, you go to... Well, yes, you go to the doctor. Tell him to bring the magistrates here, to the Admiral Binbo, to get... All of old Flint's crew, all of them that's left. I was Flint's first mate, and I'm the only one that knows the place. He gave it to me when he was dying. But don't tell the doctor, unless 
they get the black spot on me. Or unless you see the black dog or the sailor with one leg. But what is the black spot, Captain? I asked. That's a sort of warning, mate. If I get the black spot, it means they are coming to get me and what I have got. Keep your eyes open, Jim, and I'll give you half of everything. I promise you. What would I have done if everything had gone well? I do not know. But my poor father died quite suddenly that evening. All of the neighbors came to visit and there was a lot to arrange. So I was too busy and upset to think of the captain. The following day, the captain came downstairs, ate a little and got himself some rum. On the night before, we buried my father. He was as drunk as ever. He sat at the table with his sword ready in front of him, singing his ugly old sea songs. But he was still very weak and seemed to be getting worse, not better. Several days later, on a cold, foggy afternoon, I was standing at the door, full of sad thoughts about my father. As I stood there, I saw someone coming slowly along the road. The man was blind. He was walking along, tapping his stick in front of him. He wore a cloth over his eyes and nose and was bent over. I had never in my life seen such a terrible-looking man. He stopped a little away from the inn, and he said in a loud voice, Will any good man tell a poor blind man where he is? You are at the Admiral Binbow, I replied. Give me your hand, young friend, and lead me in, he said. I held out my hand, and the horrible man held it hard. He pulled me up close to him and said, Now, boy, take me in, into the captain. Sir, I said, I can't. The captain is not what he used to be. He sits with his sword ready. Take me in, or I'll break your arm, he said, and pulled my arm roughly. It was the hardest, coldest voice I had ever heard. I was so frightened that I led him into the room where the captain was sitting. The poor captain lifted his head, and it was easy to see that he was very frightened. Now, Bill, sit where you are, said the man. Hold out your left hand, boy. Take his left hand and bring it near my right hand. We both did what we were told, and I saw him put something into the captain's hand, which quickly closed on it. The blind man suddenly went out of the door. I stood without moving and heard his stick go tap-tapping down the street. The captain looked down into his hand. Ten o'clock, he cried. I've got six hours, he said, and tried to stand up, but he suddenly put his hand to his neck, and then, with a strange sound, fell face first onto the floor. I shouted to my mother, but it was too late. The captain was dead.